Good evening, everyone. I, Atash Sauja, would like to welcome you all to our uh, monthly symposium organized by ITRA for Pakistan. This month, we have a very special guest with us and again, with a very special topic. Uh, this month's our topic is Islam, Law and the Modern State. And with us uh, is Dr. Arif Jamal. Okay, so Dr. Arif Jamal has studied politics at McGill University and law at the University of Toronto and was called to the bar of British Columbia. He is a graduate from the Jippish. Um, he was in the class of 1997 and subsequently he undertook postgraduate work um, in the United Kingdom earning LLM degree, particularly in Islamic law from the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, University of London. And then he went to University College London for his doctorate. His research and teaching interest particularly revolve around um, law and religion in Muslim context, legal and political theories. He has authored a book called Islam, Law and the Modern State. It was published in 2018. And he has also co-edited a book called Regulating Religion in Asia, uh, Norms, Modes and Challenges, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. At present, Dr. Jamal is serving as an associate professor in the Faculty of Law and is also the deputy director of the Center for the Asian Legal Studies at the National University of Singapore. He has recently been appointed at the Board of Governors of the Institute of Smiley Studies, London. Um, I welcome you, Dr. Arif Jamal. And we would like to, on behalf of Itra Pakistan, we would like to congratulate you on your recent appointment at um, the Board of Governors at the IAS. Thank you very much, Acha. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your kind introduction and uh, thank you for the congratulations. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and uh, it's an honor to be with all of you today. And certainly uh, it's been an honor to have been appointed to the Board of the IAS. Thank you. Our, our good wishes are with you, and we hope that in the next decade to come, you and the entire team can do a marvelous job for our Jamaat worldwide and thank the global you, Muslim thank community. Thank you. Thank you uh, so as the title suggests, Islam, Law, and the Modern State, um, today we will be talking about uh, Islamic law, how it interacts with more modern nation states, and how the state, with its uh, all its privileges and power intervenes and whether it, uh, how does it affect our pre-modern political and legal heritage? Yeah. I'm sure all of you have uh, several questions uh, by just looking at the title. And uh, Dr. Arif Jamal's recent book discusses this very topic and that's why it's very interesting and has the same title as our session's title today. So Dr. Jafal, uh, Jamal, before I start, um, we get to see that the word Sharia um, in many Muslim countries since 1970s, there has been this trend where um, Muslim politicians have tried to include Sharia as a or the uh, source of uh, legislation. Uh, where it is uh, in, in the former context, uh, where it is our source, it is one of the sources and they are open to borrow from other sources as well. But where it is the only or the dominant source, we get to see that um, the picture, the mindset is very different. And not only that, unfortunately, several organizations globally from South Asia to Middle East to North Africa, uh, they have emerged and uh, taken up arms and have used the term Sharia, the term of Islamic law, and have implemented a particular type of law uh, with this terminology because of which we get to see that within the media, there is this hype that if uh, Islamic law gets implemented, um, women and minorities will have no right. They'll be treated as second class citizens. Uh, there'll be cruel punishments for uh, minor, uh, what do you say, crimes. So that is this whole notion. And uh, when we get to see or hear public debates, uh, whether on television or in newspapers, we get to see that not everyone grasps the idea very well of what Islamic law is. 
Yeah. It, it is definitely not rooted in the seventh century Arabian context. It is a much later or a continuous production that right. uh, continued during even the Ottoman period or the Mughal period in South Asia. So if you can briefly talk about this particular misconception of Sharia and how yeah. it has affected our understanding of sure. this terminology. Sure, sure, sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, kind of rich uh, opening question. So let me just say that in part, what, what you have just said was um, uh, the, the picture you've just painted was part of the motivation for me to undertake uh, this study and then to kind of complete the book. Because I think one of the great questions that is facing contemporary Muslim contexts <clears throat> in different ways, in different parts, of the world is precisely this question of, uh, you know, what is Islamic law and what do we do with this thing called the Sharia? And as you've said, you know, it has been uh, in the last uh, few decades, certainly, um, there has been a, a sort of emphasis uh, in Pakistan, I think you'll call it the Shariatization, right? This notion of the, of making places uh, making states more um, uh, Sharia oriented, making the Sharia, ma making references, putting references to the Sharia in the constitution, for instance, making it, as you said, either a source of law or the source of law, and doing a lot of things, taking a lot of steps in the name of the realization of the Sharia in, 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 in the state. And as you have rightly said, this has caused concern, both in Muslim quarters, uh, as well as, uh, and perhaps even more so, in non-Muslim quarters, because of uh, difference, uh, because of the in, in understanding and interpretation of what the Sharia is. So in non-Muslim quarters, I agree with what you uh, said that, you know, a lot of times people think the Sharia means doing horrible things to people. It is some sort of retrograde. It can be barbaric. It is uh, not, uh, it operates in a sort of knee jerk way. It's not respectful to women. It's not respectful to minorities. And therefore they, they see the Sharia really as, as something barbaric. <clears throat> in, in, in Muslim quarters, there's also a concern. There's a concern particularly from this concern about, um, you know, who gets to decide what the Sharia is uh, and what its terms are, and a particular concern when the state starts getting involved in applying or enforcing the Sharia. Um, <clears throat> so let me then go to the other part of your question, which is, you know, what is causing some of these concerns? And I think there's often a sort of misunderstanding that occurs, I'm afraid to say, both in, amongst Muslims as well as amongst non-Muslims, but perhaps less forgivably amongst Muslims because perhaps Muslims should, should know better about the idea of the Sharia. So one thing is some people, some people will say, you know, the Sharia said, but you know, Sharia says this or Sharia says that. Sharia demands this or Sharia demands that. And one of the things we know from history, and you mentioned it, in mm -hmm. your initial comment, is that the Sharia has some sense been an ongoing discourse, right? Uh, it is something that uh, we know, and this isn't just uh, an Ismaili position, this isn't just a, a Shia position, this is something that we know from the history. There have been many different articulations of this idea of what the Sharia is over time. And we know this, because of at least two things which are fairly commonly understood and I'm sure will be commonly understood in your audience. The first is that there is not one school of law or one madhab. There have been different madhahib that have different schools of Islamic law, if you will, that have developed over time. They have developed in different parts of the world. They have developed uh, so in different geographies as well as in, you know, they varied over history. But all of them would say that they are expressing or trying to express, give the best expression to this thing called the Sharia. And when what the, what the, uh, 
what the madhabs have done or what the madhabs have produced over time and what the scholars associated with those madhabs has produced over time is something which we know as the literature of fiqh. And fiqh is the work product uh, of scholars. It is their understanding, their interpretation, their articulation of the ideas that, of, of what the sharia is. It's, it's their attempt to make it more concrete, to make it more uh, tangible, and to answer questions with it. And over time, there have been not just dozens, not even just hundreds, but thousands of works of fiqh. And those works of fiqh don't always agree. So when people say, you know, the Sharia demands this, Sharia demands that, one has to say, but according to whose understanding of the Sharia, according to which articulation of the Sharia, when you look at all of the different varieties, and one can compare it by analogy, for example, to the interpretation of the Quranic text. So we all know that there have been these things called tafsirs or uh, the tafasir, as you say in the Arabic plural, right? And we know that there have been multiple um, hundreds, thousands of tafsirs, right? Certain verses of the Quran have attracted thousands of, of uh, different tafsirs which in, read those verses differently, which emphasize different things. They're looking at the same language, the same text of the Quran, but they give different interpretations to it. That's not unusual. That happens in uh, a lot of different contexts. It happens in works of literature. If, in, um, if you were to ask somebody in Pakistan, you know, uh, what does Ghalib's poetry mean? I mean, you're going to have a variety of different interpretations of what that poetry means, what that poetry says, or Rumi, or whatever else. When it comes to the Sharia, there has been a, a process which, as I said, is analogous to that. The scholars over time, in different times, in different places, have looked at the source material, first and foremost, the Quran but also the, uh, the Sunnah, particularly the Sunnah of the, of the Holy Prophet, may peace be upon him, as well as other, uh, other, what I call juristic principles, other interpretive principles. So for example, they have talked about the importance of reasoning by analogy, which is in Arabic is called Qiyas. They've talked about consensus, if there can be consensus of opinion, which in Arabic is called ijma. But there are other principles as well that they have looked at. The importance of um, public, uh, public interest, the importance, so, which is called some maslaha, the importance of what some people call the intentions or the overall principles of the sharia, the so-called maqasid al-sharia. And when they have used all of this material, textual material, non-textual material, um, so the textual, of course, the Quranic text, but also the Sunnah material, uh, non-textual, some of these principles, and they have worked on it and they have developed different opinions over time and in different places. And one of the things that I think unfortunately gets lost, even in Muslim context and even amongst Muslims, is this understanding of this historical process of developing the Sharia. This discourse, that's why I said discourse. It has been a sort of discourse between, within the community, between uh, scholars in the texts and other materials. And you said in your question, for instance, that this has continued to Ottoman times. I would say it, it, it continues today. And let me give you an illustration of something that's happened very, very recently. So we, we are, you know, none of us knew what uh, COVID was uh, for, you know, uh, 13, 14 months ago. Now we all know what it is. And of course, nowadays, the vaccines are being rolled out. And here in Singapore, where I live, there's an Islamic religious council. <clears throat> and the, the first batch of vaccines has now arrived in Singapore. It's yet to be administered, but they, the vaccines have arrived. Uh, some vaccines have arrived, and now they are talking about the process of the of uh, you know a plan to vaccinate people. And one question that emerged among some uh, 
particularly the Muslim community, is, is the vaccine uh, acceptable? Can Muslims take the vaccine? And the Islamic Religious Council a few days ago, maybe last week, but not that long ago, gave their opinion, gave their fatwa on this, on this question, right? And of course, we know what a fatwa is. A fatwa is a legal opinion. And they used a principle saying that the pr protection and preservation of life is a fundamental principle in uh, Muslim legal understanding. And to the extent that the vaccine does this, the vaccine would do this. To the other extent that the vaccine does not cause harm, they said one should get away because one of the questions that was put to them was halalness. Right? Are the components of the vaccine sufficiently halal? And they shifted the question. They said it's not, it's not about thinking about halalness of the, of the materials inside the vaccine, but rather what is, what is the overarching principle? And so what they were doing was going back, and so they talked about this preservation of life, and they affirmed that this has been part of the legal tradition. So what we have to understand uh, is that a lot of times uh, Muslims as well as non-Muslims are unfortunately, in my experience, unaware not only of the historical trajectory that has been there, that continues to be there, but also of some of these principles. If you were to say to some people that, you know, the Sharia, uh, what, uh, uh, they say, are you in favor of the preservation of life? Of course I'm in favor of the preservation of life. Do you know that's a Sharia principle? Oh, no, that can't be a Sharia principle. That's not what the Sharia thinks about. But in fact, of course, as we've just seen with the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore's recent decision, which is precisely uh, what the Sharia thinks about. So this is why this is why this this issue is there. This this problem is there that I was uh, trying to bring uh, uh, out in, in in the argument in the book. So, um, thank you for unpacking this big, uh, huge topic. And I, I think one major distinction that we should all be able to make and appreciate is that um, what often we use the term Sharia for the entire FIC um, discourse. Um, but we should appreciate that when we talk about FIC, it is basically a human effort to understand divine's work. And what we say divine, it's when whatever we derive from the Kalam, the Quran and prophetic uh, text. So that is the fundamental distinction that we all should be able to appreciate. Um, Dr. Jamal, I want to ask one important question here. Um, you rightly mentioned that it's happening even today and across the board in all Muslim majority countries and even in countries where Muslims are in minority, the personal yeah. law is still being tailored to a certain extent yeah. according to the local context. But my question is that to what extent is our pre-modern political legal heritage or uh, Islamic opinions, the fatwas of the pre-modern times, are still compatible uh, in the modern context? And where do we get to see that the, the sh this issue of incompatibility comes in? If you may uh, share your thoughts on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. Um... Just before I turn to that, there is actually one thing about the fifth material that uh, I want to, like, I should have said a bit earlier, but your, uh, you know, response reminds me. You know, when, when a legal opinion is given, when a fatwa is given, one of the things we also have to remember, and sometimes people don't, is that typically a fatwa ends with a particular phrase, or la alam. And that means, but God knows best. And that is a mark of, of humility and also a fallibility on the parts of the scholar, right? So we, we should always remember that even the, you know, the scholars, you know, some scholars will do this. I know they'll, they'll put this at the end uh, as a sort of pro forma, but fundamentally that is what it means. That, you know, this is, this is simply my, that is my, as a scholar, the scholar is saying, this is my best effort to get the answer right, but I don't know if I get it right. And we should, we should have that sort of, should understand that. And it, it's, a, it's a reflexive process. 
let me turn to, to the main part of your question, which was this um, question of compatibility or incompatibility. And I think one of the great uh, issues, one of the tensions is precisely come with this idea of the modern state. And the modern state is different from the pre-modern state. Uh, the pre-modern state was, uh, uh, you know, did certain things, uh, had defense, had taxes, you know, regulated markets, these sorts of things. We know, we know this to be the case. Ambassadors were exchanged, uh, you know, governors were there, there were courts and things, but it was a much less bureaucratic structure. And to some extent, it could be a more kind of pluralistic structure. And some of that becomes a little bit lost or might have to be, in fact, recovered in modern discourse. And what do I mean by this? So let's take the example of, uh, let, let's take some examples from, from history, okay? Uh, in the context of the Ismaili Jamaat, we often talk about the Fatimid period. And one of the things that we are always told about the Fatimid period was that, you know, the, the, of course the Ismailis were, you had the Imam Khalif, but the Ismailis were still a minority community within the Fatimid Empire. And you had other communities, other Muslim communities, non-Muslim communities, and they continued to live and they had some of their own laws to govern them in certain aspects of life, particularly what we might call personal law aspects. Okay? But it wasn't just the Fatimids that did this. In the Ottoman Empire, it was a very large empire. And it also spanned different communities. You had uh, Christians living under the Ottomans and Jews living under the Ottomans. And although it was a Muslim empire, of course, it had, a, it had the Sultan, it too had an amount of you know, plurality that it was accepting under Ottoman control. The same with the Mughals in South Asia. Right, you had different communities living there. And these were all, as it were, pre-modern. The Ottomans were sort of at the cusp of what we might call the period of modernity, what historians often call the period of modernity. But the others were, were pre-modern. Pre and you had a less invasive uh, state sometimes, uh, a less regulatory state sometimes. And when we talk about Islamic law, we typically talk about, um, you know, the, the scholars would typically talk about sort of the early period and then a classical period and then sort of everything after that, right? But they stopped the classical period, depends sort of roughly 10th, 12th century. That was way before we had these modern states, way before we had these modern states with all of their infiltration. Right, so for instance, uh, if you think about the work of uh, the great scholar Ghazali, he dies in 1111 of the common era, 1111 uh, AD, if you will. You know, uh, one, one author said, you know, Ghazali, who's often heralded with great, uh, uh, a great scholar in, in the legal tradition, as well as in philosophy and other areas, that Ghazali would have been mortified <laughs> to think of a state doing all of these things, of imposing all of these aspects uh, onto people. And again, let me illustrate with an example. Some years ago, <clears throat> uh, my wife and I, uh, if you know the geography, Singapore is very close to Malaysia, geographically very close to Malaysia. Uh, and uh, you know, one travels to Malaysia uh, a fair bit. We were in the airport in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia's capital flying back to Singapore. It was during the month of Ramadan. Uh, it was, it had already gone, the sun had already set. So it was evening, we were taking an evening flight back. And uh, we were at the airport a little bit before our flight. And so we thought we'd go to a coffee shop. And I, I said, all right, you know, what would you like? And I will go get some coffee. And then I went up to the tail of the coffee shop. There was a sign there. And the sign said, um, we, uh, the state regulation, that particular state in Malaysia, uh, says that you know, Muslims are not allowed to uh, buy any food or drink during the fasting hours. And I looked at this sign and I asked the person there, 
um, you know, uh, do you ask people if they are Muslims or not? If they were to come to you at uh, you know two thirty in the afternoon and say, "I'd like coffee," do you do you ask them that are you Muslim or not? That you, whether you can have the coffee? And they said, "Well, we don't really do that." <laughs> you know? And I thought, you know, how strange it is that the state in Malaysia is now trying through its regulations to say, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't eat or drink if you're a Muslim doing the fasting, because surely that is something that the individual will do, uh, you know, out of their own commitment if they want to fast and they believe in they should fast in Ramadan, then, then, then they fast. It's not a question of the state saying, hey, you know, should we, should we be policing? And these sorts of things would not have been done I think to the same extent in the pre-modern time because you didn't have that bureaucratic structure in quite the same way. And that, I'm sorry for going on a bit, but that is the issue of the compatibility. When you have structures that were developed in a particular context, how can they be used in a different context, particularly when as some would say, there was, you know, the, the, uh, there was a sort of classic period and things got uh, uh, defined fully in that classical period. So, and in the, in the legal terms, you often talk about, um, you know, this idea of the closing of what they call the closing of the geisha which they had and then following. So being in uh, you know, being, being in taqlid, we follow now what others have done. And that, that can be challenging in at least two respects. Of course, it's challenging because there are new things that are going to come up. So uh, some years ago when I was studying in London, my teacher had come to a conference in Malaysia. I had never been to Malaysia at that time. And he came back to London and he was delayed coming back. And when he came back to London, he said, I'm sorry, you know, I had gone to this conference in Malaysia and they'd asked me to stay behind because they wanted to know, uh, he worked on uh, Islamic commercial law a lot. They want to know about the regulation, the Sharia uh, ideas about the regulation of the derivatives market. And uh, so we said, well, what, what, what did you tell them? What did the Sharia say about the regulation of the derivative market? He said, well, the Sharia says nothing about it because they didn't have they had no idea about something called the derivative market. But then I had to try and think, you know, what are the principles that might be there? So one can be an incompatibility because you have new issues. They, couldn't have been foreseen. When mobile phones came out, people were asking, you know, is it halal to use a mobile phone? And I mean, you couldn't have asked a scholar in the 12th century or 14th century or 15th century about whether or not you could use a mobile phone any more than you could ask them about the digital market, any more than you could ask them about COVID-19 vaccines. This was simply uh, one of our teachers in, uh, at the IS was uh, the late Professor Muhammad Akun you would say this was the unthought. It was unthinkable. It was unthought. They couldn't have thought this. So that's one of the incompatibilities. The second incompatibility is the incompatibility that comes from this bureaucratic state structure. You know, to what extent, and it's a question, to what extent do you have the state going around as you were enforcing question, enforcing issues like, for example, fasting during Ramadan, that really might be a matter of personal piety. So to give you an instant, just to compare, I talked about Malaysia. Let me compare Malaysia and Singapore. Singapore Malaysia is a Muslim majority environment, about 60%. Singapore is a Muslim minority environment, about 12, 15% of the population. There is an Islamic religious council in Singapore. They will do things like provide halal certification for restaurants and food and things. But they don't go around telling Muslims about fasting during Ramadan. I mean, they'll tell you, you know, if you ask them, should you fast? They'll say, you, you should fast. But they don't go and enforce it upon you. They don't go policing, you know, if you're a Muslim, hey, did you know you're, you're about to eat this thing? It didn't have a halal <laughs> a stamp on it. Should you be eating it? They don't do that because they leave this to the individual. And that is the question of how compatible it is to take these 
some of these notions which were developed very much in part of the legal tradition and they were developed in part of the legal tradition in a different way from the way modern law has developed. I was trained you know, as, a, as a Canadian lawyer. When you ask what does Canadian law say about food, it doesn't talk about you know, purity. It talks about public health and public safety. It would regulate food that way. Are they producing food in a way that's hygienic? But it doesn't say, you know, this food is considered uh, haram in Canada. It doesn't do that. It leaves that to, uh, to individual, in, individual citizens. So that's the other incompatibility. So um, if I may just briefly summarize, the first major issue is that the diversity that we had within the tradition, um, the opinions that were coming in on the same issue, that diversity doesn't always reflect um, in the contemporary times when we, when the state is trying to enforce a certain position. So that is the first. Second, um, there are plenty of unforeseen circumstances, issues that were or could not have been thought on in the pre-modern times, like you mentioned, yeah. derivatives market. And the third, uh, the modern state with its hegemonic power and uh, all its instruments, it wasn't like that uh, even in majority or Islamic lands or during all the dynasties and empires that we think about. It wasn't in the, uh, the state function wasn't in the same way that we see today. So these are the reasons that we get to see this, uh, this compatibility issue in the current times. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I think I would emphasize, I mean, I think the first and third are, are linked and I would, I would emphasize them. I mean, you know, there is, uh, and I don't know if it's entirely true, but they say sometimes, if you look at the courtyard of mosques, they have these sort of four arches. Uh, some of the mosques in Egypt are like that. And the story says that, you see, what they would do is they'd have a Hanafi scholar in, under one arch, a Maliki in the other, the, you know, Han, um, Humbly in the third is Shafi in the uh, other one. Whereas now, the states, whether it's Pakistan or others, might have to choose one. Say, this is what Islamic law is. And that's, yeah. that's different from what may have happened in the past. In fact, the very historic fact that uh, these four uh, Sunni Mazahib that we talk about today, they emerged out of uh, dozens that were there uh, in 9th, 10th century, and this competition and only the four, uh, I would say, sustained through that's over right. the centuries. And that's, right. that's only in the Sunni context. When we see only Shia, we all have uh, Isnashri, uh, Ismaili, and then also have Ibadis. Yes. Uh, so Yes, yes. And then you have other traditions. You have Sufi and other traditions which have their own way of um, sort of interacting with all of these so, you know, you, you can talk about, you know, multiple sort of different interpretation. And of course, let's not forget, it's also a, a, a geography matter at the same time. You know, Maliki is in one place and Maliki is in another place. Shafi is in one place and Shafi is in another place. You may not think the same way. Same you know, way. It's, it, sounds a bit, it sounds a bit funny and if you'll pardon it, but you know, <clears throat> this, these schools of law are broad churches. <laughs> They contain a lot of opinion and they have always contained a lot of opinion because you can always talk about majority and minority opinions. Let's take the Hanafi Madhab. You might say, but this is the majority opinion in the Hanafi Madhab, but they are minority opinion on different issues. So both over time and over space, there can be differences. And in, and again, this is not just, it's not just an Ismaili thing. This is not just a Shia thing. In the literary heritage of Islamic law, there is a body of literature which is called the literature of iqtilaf. And iqtilaf is, is disagreement. You know, in Arabic, if you want to say, you know, they're disagreeing, you say iqtilaf bainuhu wa bainuhu. Okay? Iqtilaf literature, this literature where there have been different opinions on a question, is a long standing. Uh, literature in in you know Islamic legal traditions we have it, so scholars would collect. Okay, on this issue, this is the Hanafi view. Well, this is the majority Hanafi. Then the minority have, and the Shafi'is think this, and the Maliki thinks. This, except some of them think this, and and we have it, and that's just part part of the record. So that is one of the things which can cause real 
uh, a real problem for the modern stuff. <laughs> if you say, well, actually, if you collect all of the opinions, it's not even just these four, because of course you can't have Shia opinions, but, but even within them, they have diversity, then the state goes, oh no, now what can I do? And, and it can wittingly or unwittingly do violence to that plurality, do violence to that diversity by saying, okay, will we pick this one? And as scholars have said, how do you go about doing, who, you know, how can you do that? You don't even say, wala, wala, <laughs> right? Like the scholars. But Dr. Jamal, if I may ask, in contemporary times, in Muslim majority countries, um, and, and especially where the Islamist discourse is increasing, uh, by the year. So for example, including Malaysia, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, all these and Middle Eastern countries. We get to see that um, the clerics, they are asking uh, the state to intervene in certain matters. The clerics are asking um, the state to make a law to formulate a policy because they can see that although they have a following, uh, yeah. they have the member to share their opinion on a particular case but it is only through the power of the state that you can bring about a certain change. So um, do you think that at, at a certain point, this is bound to become a problem that because Muslims are asking the state, uh, the clerics? Of course, I mean, it is, It is again, this is part of the motivation uh, for the book. It is, it is it, it's not just bound to become, it is a problem now. Yeah. And, the issue, as far as I see it, is that, you know, you're right, some clerics are going to say, we want the state to do X. And others, other Muslims are going to say, we don't want the state to do X. And so how do you deal with these different opinions? What is the state supposed to do? And one of the arguments that I tried to make in, in the book was that we have to have, um, that if, if the state throws its weight behind one opinion or the other, it is doing some violence. It is actually wrong stepping the very plural and diverse history that has been there. And therefore, one has to think of what I called justice's discourse. That it comes out of the, our notions of justice should be discursive. We should have a conversation. I'm not suggesting that we follow the answer that some have followed in, in that is in contemporary Muslim context, that the only thing to do is simply to uh, uh, delegitimize the voice of uh, those who may have um, religious uh, inspiration and motivation. But at the same time, they don't get, I was going to say a trump card. So when I say trump card, I don't mean President Donald Trump card, but, <laughs> but they, don't, they don't get the trump card in the way that they don't get to say, this is it, it's, it's our decision, right? Rather, we have to be discursive about this. And that in fact, I think is a better understanding, <clears throat> to go back to the earlier point, is a better understanding of the way in which uh, Islamic law has developed. In fact, I often, when I'm teaching this, I often say to the students that uh, sometimes I prefer the phrase Muslim legal traditions to Islamic law. And I prefer that for at least two reasons. First of all, it is a plural uses the word traditions. And so it captures the fact that this has not been a univocal set of uh, expressions, but rather it has been plurivocal. We've just talked about that. There've been multiple voices, multiple schools, multiple interpretations, multiple scholars. The second thing is it emphasizes the agency of people in trying to work out what this Sharia is how to give this Sharia expression. Because it was not all found or not all findable 
the answers were not all findable. If you look at the Quranic text, you know there are, um, uh, particularly if you look at uh, annotated versions of the Quran, you're going to see uh, people say, well, the, the, this verse means this. And, you know, when one first reads it, one thinks, oh, well, uh, you know, this is what they said, that's what the verse means. But if one thinks about it a little bit more, you say, but I mean, how do you know that's what the verse means? And how, how is it somebody else can read the verse differently? And in fact, the verses are translated differently, right? Urdu shares more words with Arabic uh, that wouldn't, that would lend, make the translation a bit more, perhaps easier, right? The Arabic word for history is tariq, the Urdu word for history is tariq, right? You have to translate that. But um, when you do it with other languages, and even with Urdu, there could be, you might say, well, actually, I think it's this Urdu word which captures the Arabic best. And so like, no, it's that Urdu word which captures it best here. And so with other languages. And, you know, it's, it's, it's humans that have done this. <laughs> it's Muslims that have done this, sincerely. But it, it's, a, it's a human agency. And that's what I think sometimes gets lost. When the clerics say, you know, you must do this in the name of the Sharia, <laughs> one might say, but wait, you mean in your understanding of the Sharia? There are other people that may not think the Sharia the same way. A very good example from Pakistan comes from your famous uh, uh, Munir report. And it was done by the retired Justice Munir in the 1960s, I think it was something like that. There's a, and I, I uh, the report, um, I don't, I don't have my copy here with me. But there's one point where Justice Munir said, you know, I gathered these ulama and I asked them two questions, which I thought it would be easy for them to answer. What is Islam and who is a Muslim? He said, I thought, you know, this should be, this should be able to be. He said, but the answers were so diverse that actually if I followed one scholar's answer, the other one would say, no, but that's, you know, you're wrong. You're not a Muslim if you follow, if you listen to this guy. And so he said, you know, I was left, uh, Munir says, you know, it, it showed that actually there was, there was disagreement about these things. And if there's disagreement about that, just in Pakistan, just a particular, just among the ulama of Pakistan at that time. Imagine 1400 years of history, uh, majority geography from the Indonesian archipelago across South Asia, Central Asia, North Africa to the end of the Mediterranean. Then you had all these minority communities, the sort of diaspora communities. And all of that time and all of that geography and over a billion people and you put that into a pot and you stir it there's a scholar named Carl Ernst that says, actually, if you think about that, what would be surprising is not diversity. What would be surprising would be unanimity. And there hasn't been unanimity of interpretation. And there hasn't been unanimity of legal interpretation. And that's what happens when the state gets involved in that. It's, a, it's an issue. I spoke about justice as a discourse. Okay. Now, my question to you is, do you think that the definition of justice, the values underpinning the concept of justice has changed over the centuries uh, from the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, okay. to uh, what we say the medieval era and to the modern times? Well, I think <clears throat> and that, that's a very difficult question to answer because, you know, for thousands of years, we've been asking ourselves, what is justice? You know, in different societies, in West and East, and we've not got the answer to what justice is. But I like to think of it like a horizon. It is something that we are trying, constantly working towards, but we'll never maybe achieve, but that's, that doesn't make the horizon less beautiful. Right? And that one is constantly having to calibrate it against different uh, matters. So, for instance, let's take <clears throat> the question of um, 
uh, justice in terms of uh, inheritance. Okay, we all know that at a certain there was a, there were points in time, and this is not just in the Muslim world. This is in the West as well, where uh, gender roles were very different from what they are today. Women's participation, for example, in the workforce and having independent incomes or having the capacity to have independent incomes was very, very different than it is in the world today. And of course, it varies. It's very different within countries and across countries. But generally speaking, I'm talking about generally speaking. At that time, one might have said that because there were more limited opportunities to develop independent sources of income, that uh, and wealth, that uh, you know, it should be there should be more there should be responsibility on the males who generally were able to generate more wealth to care for the women, okay, care for their female relations, for example. That might have also suggested the way property was inherited. Today, our social conditions are different in many parts of the world. And therefore, perhaps the inheritance rules need to catch up to that. Now, is that, a, is that a different understanding of justice? Or is that simply saying, actually the idea is of fairness, of a certain equality or uh, uh, equal opportunity, but the rules are achieving that are different. We talk about uh, income inequality. I don't, I don't hear mean in gender terms or not only in gender terms, but we're talking about it generally in the world. We're talking about, you know, income inequality. Do we now need to change the way this, for example, our rules about property holding? Because, you know, property is becoming something where we, thought, we often think about property as tangible things, you know, uh, my pen, <laughs> right, my computer, etc. But with property is now becoming intangible, we're talking about intangible property, what lawyers talk about as intellectual property. And if that is becoming the most valuable, then our whole understanding of property law may have to be different. Again, is it a different is it different understandings of justice or is it the realization and manifestation of justice so i am one who still believes that we can maybe talk about justice in a capital j sense right but i don't think we will ever uh, uh, in that sense, you could say justice is a noun, right? But in the idea of justice as discourse, I was urging us to think about it more as a verb, as something that we do because we don't agree on the definition of the noun. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I like the concept of it, but you know, the realization of it is a different matter. But Dr. Jamal, um... There are many voices um, in Muslim context, for example, in Pakistan, where we get to hear that in matters of uh, finance, for example, uh, Islamic banking, Islamic insurance, because there is little to no precedence, there is, and uh, whatever is there in the Nas, the text, is abstract, quote unquote. Yes. Um, that's why one has the capacity and the authority to use their reason yes. in those issues and make new laws yes. according to the changing times. Yeah. But they would often argue that in matters of personal law, yeah. where certain texts give a very categorical, very explicit judgment to use the word, yeah. um, in those cases, in those yeah. issues, one should not be using their personal reason, personal right. opinions. And in fact, they would point out to the verses in the Quran where they say that whatever they are doing, they're following their own desires and not the word of the God. So the, the, 
I, I understand that this rhetoric and this rhetoric is very powerful for the masses yes. uh, to say that you know this is written in the text in the word of God. How can you contradict it? So the whole this whole discussion of abstract versus explicit and yeah. being yeah. able to use our reason. What do you have to say about this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me use uh, a Pakistani scholar to give uh, uh, an answer, at least potential answer. Uh, the late, great Fazal Rahman from Pakistan, <clears throat> who I know is controversial, I mean, among some in, in Pakistan as well. But Rahman talked about this sort of double movement, understanding of the Quranic text. <clears throat> you move from the general to the specific and from the specific to the general. You're moving both ways and urged an understanding of the Quranic uh, text in a holistic way. So my concern is sometimes that uh, uh, there can be this process of trying to cherry pick and to say that, um, for instance, when we're dealing with questions of banking uh, and finance, uh, there, because we don't have explicit text, you know, we understand the, the context, right? Fairness, equity, etc. But here, you know, all of a sudden, we, in the face of this text, we think that this context doesn't apply. Now, how is it that these basic principles that you say can, should motivate the understanding, you think are suspended in this case? So, the other option is to say, actually, you know, these principles should be there kind of throughout. And even those things which seem to be, and, you know, when we say explicit, let's be, let's be clear that uh, not everybody agrees with what is explicit and what is implicit. There's a verse in the Quran, I think it's uh, Surah, it Surah 3, verse 7. Um, uh, it, you know, it says that the, we revealed unto you a book and in it there are verses which are clear and others which are allegorical. Mutashabihat and muhkimat. Mutashabihat and And, but it doesn't come with a little footnote. They say, and by the way, these are the ones which are clear and these are the ones which are allegorical. Hmm? <clears throat> that understanding that things are clear or not, that things are explicit or not, that things are categorical or not, is debated, right? The whole, like, ties into what we were talking about earlier about the tafsir, it ties into this whole question of interpretation. So the first thing is to ask, you know, is to is to you say uh, when you say that you know the, here we can't use reason because there is a clear text. You know, do we agree that there is a clear text? And a lot of times there isn't really agreement that there is a clear text. Yeah. Some people talk about also <clears throat> the the uh, historical context of the text. What in Arabic is called the asbab al nuzul the conditions of revelation, the conditions that were there during the revelation. And whether or not, therefore, this uh, uh, so-called clear text is something which uh, applies across time or was specific to circumstances. Quranic text, for example, talks about uh, the virtue in freeing slaves, in manumitting slaves. Okay, that is not something that would apply in, in a contemporary context. We don't, we don't operate in these contexts of slavery anymore. But what might be the principle there? <laughs> right? And is there this principle in these verses? Are there principles of justice in these verses, which it was saying, listen, there is a practice that is happening now. Uh, we have this we have these conditions of slavery, and it is virtuous to free these slaves. Is there an embedded principle of justice? There? If that is the case, even though that is, you know, I mean, it, it does, you know, explicitly talk about slaves, then, you know, we have, maybe we have to read the text that way. 
it, I'm not saying this is the answer that's going to convince everybody. Uh, just like Fazit Rahman didn't convince everybody. Uh, but I think one has to be more thoughtful about looking at these materials and engaging in a dis discussion with those who would say, but here we cannot, here we have to stop. Yeah, you rightly pointed out uh, during my uh, MA, I wrote a paper on uh, the verse on the polygamy, uh, multiple marriages, where it says uh, marry two, three, or four. four but then yes. it says only if you can be just to them. Yes. And then I try to look that how the word just in that context um, has been interpreted in our uh, tafsir discourse. And not only with time, but also with uh, space, like you pointed out earlier, uh, there is a great diversity in yes. just what that word, one word means exactly. uh, in the case of polygamy. So, exactly. and in that, in people, a, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Often people like to say that that is an explicit word saying that Precisely. polygamy is allowed. Precisely. But, Precisely. Precisely. I can tell you, you know, as, as you will probably know, and I'm sure you probably discovered it when you were writing that paper, that, that is from uh, Surah Nisa, of course, the fourth Surah, the Surah of Women. Later on in Surah Nisa, there's a verse that says, uh, you know, but you can only be just to one wife. At one. Right? So some people will combine these and say, this one says may two, three or four, but only if you can be just. To, and this verse says, but you can only be just to one at a time. So therefore the answer is one. I had one uh, student, in fact, I taught a course at, at, at the ISMC when you were there. There was a, there was a student from Egypt at the time, uh, an, an Azar, a graduate of the Azar, actually. He said, you know, there was, uh, when they were learning this in Egypt, not that this was the opinion of the scholars at the Azhar, but he said there was one person that, one of, the, one of his teachers said, you know, somebody had told me that there was one interpretation that thought it was summative. It was one plus two plus three plus four. So the answer was 10. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think even the people in the other were like, what? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Again, these are these are verses which, as you say, some people say, but this is clear. This is this is explicit, right? And but there are different interpretations even of that, and of that word, just, just that word. Yes, definitely. So, if I'm gathering it right, it's a matter of educating more than anything and uh, showing Muslims around the world that look at the diversity that we have inherited in our uh, legal political tradition and appreciate that in its entirety rather than just cherry pick whatever uh, suits us um, or favors us in a particular context. Yes, and to do that sincerely, and I mean, I, I, I don't like saying this, um, uh, well, it, it pains me every time to say, to say this, but I'm, I'm going to say it. When we look at the challenges in the Muslim world, uh, of which of course there are, there are several, not just in the Muslim world, but if we consider the Muslim world in general, there are challenges of poverty, there are challenges of corruption, there are challenges, you know, non, numerous different challenges. But I think one of the greatest uh, challenges is the challenge of education. And I'm afraid that the levels of understanding of uh, of history, of levels of understanding of Islamic studies, for example, are not very good. So I'm told that, you know, in Pakistan, it's, you know, the best and brightest don't often choose Islamic studies, right? If you say you're doing Islamic studies, people look at you like, why would you do that? Um, and that's, that, that's a great shame. Uh, when I have taught Muslim students, there was a scholar from Qatar, legal scholar from Qatar, who uh, was visiting Singapore a few years ago. He teaches at the university there. He's Egyptian. <clears throat> he had done his PhD under uh, a scholar named Khaled Abu Fadl, who is a professor of law at the University of uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. Very uh, quite well known scholar of the tradition. <clears throat> so this guy was uh, a student of Abu Fadl. He said when he went to UCLA, Abu Fadl said to him. <clears throat> You know, I, I'm sorry to say this, but you know, the, the students which are going to be most difficult for you are the Muslim students. 
And this guy said, I, I hated that. You know, I, I resented that uh, accusation. And then I started teaching. And he said, unfortunately, I found that Abu al was, was was right. And I'm afraid I've also found that to be the case. Often that the Muslim students almost have to unlearn before they can learn. They come up with presumptions which are based on a, a very a brittle historical understanding. And I think in, in my view, and this, this does pay me to say, I think one of the greatest challenges in the Muslim world now is the challenge of education. Education generally, but certainly education about the tradition. Uh, I think within the context of the Ismaili Jamaat, hopefully things will be better. There's been a great emphasis on pursuing education and their materials for this, but uh, it, is, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. It's a challenge to learn. It's a challenge to learn the history. Um, Dr. Jamal, I would totally agree. During It has just been six months that I started uh, my PhD, but often the discussion uh, in the classroom would get um, so hard to bear because people are not open to accepting new ideas. And in fact, um, now we get to see that the new generation, uh, there are people like you rightly mentioned, who also have the classical training from their mother sons and are also pursuing academic degrees in universities. Yes. So, and in most of the cases, because the classical training precedes the uh, academic training in universities, they are very set in their ideas. Yes. And they often look down on the academic discourse as if it's trying to corrupt uh, the yes. Muslim discourse. Yes. yes, yes. I mean, that, that student that I mentioned, uh, the Egyptian who was at, at the ISMC and who had done my Islamic law course, you know, he, 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 had, he did have a degree from the Azhar. So I said to him, his name is Mustafa, I said to him, why are you taking this course? Because you've just got a degree from the other. And I mean, this is like an, this is like Islamic law 101 for people that don't know anything. And he said, the, the reason is because there, you know, the way we studied is we would take, primarily Shafi, of course, in Egypt, we would take the text and we would learn the rules about, you know, on any particular issue, commercial law, criminal law, whatever. But they never told us about the intellectual history. We we learned rules, and if you if you did if you learned these rules and if you kind of committed them to memory and you were able to reproduce them, you got your ijaza, you got your diploma, you know you know the Sharia. But this intellectual history and the questions we are asking about what it means, you know, what, what does it mean to have these these text this way? What are the other texts? Why this diversity? They were not asked that. And that's what I mean about the unlearning. Uh, I have Muslim students that sometimes take my course and they probably think this is going to be easy. You know, I know Islamic law, you know, I've gone to, I wrote the law, so it's no problem. And they, they don't know anything about, uh, 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 for example, if you expose them to some Iqtilaf literature, they're like, but that's not right. There's an answer. This is the answer. And I said, okay, well, um, this is this is the work of Ibn Rushd. You've heard of Ibn Rushd, so you want to tell him he's wrong. You tell me, you tell Ibn Rushd that he's wrong, that they're not these different answers. Ibn Rushd said this. I said yes. And that's he's that's, not right, Ibn Rushd. <laughs> Ibn Rushd, yes, yes, right. And that is that's the issue. And I, I hope that you know we uh, uh, everybody can learn this. It is it's it's very rich. It's it's got a lot of it's got a lot of diversity and a lot of different thinking and a lot of sophistication. Um, but uh, we have to remember we have to uh, we have to recapture it, recover it. I have one quick question. Um, yes, and. Uh... I would request that if you can elaborate it with some example. Uh, in contemporary context, we see that some states are trying to use multiple madhahib, like uh, discourses from multiple madhahib, to inform their policy making yes. um, in certain cases. And um, we also have a terminology for that um, in the Sharia. So if you can briefly uh, you know, share what, how sure, it, it sure, happens sure. and how the yeah. state 
works. Yeah, I mean, this is not, it's not entirely new. This is a, a thing called Talfiq, um, this notion of patching together or stitching together, taking a bit from here and a bit from there. Um, as I said, you know, there are <clears throat> not only different, uh, uh, not only the different madahib, but different opinions within the madahib, and therefore you can find on any issue quite a range of different opinions, sometimes quite contradictory, sometimes just shades of meaning. And so uh, occasionally what, what uh, people do is look for, try to stitch together this uh, body of understanding and interpretation. Again, you know, the, this, is, this is part of a set of juristic principles that have been used for a long time, right? So, you know, typically when people say, what is Shia, they're, they're, they're sort of the big four, at least in the, Funi, in the, in the Sunni understanding, in the Quran, the Sunnah, the Ijma, the consensus that they've talked about, and the Qiyas, the reasoning by analogy, but there have been numerous others. So the idea of Maslaha, or public interest, the idea of darura, necessity, the idea of tarfiq, uh, of tahayr. Um, you know, there are a number of different principles, juristic principles that have been used over time. The, the question of the, as we talked about already, the asbab al-nuzul, the conditions of revelation, uh, the, the circumstances of the revelation, the notion of the nasiq and the mansuk, the abrogating and the abrogated verses, so all of these things have been part of uh, this really rather intellectually rich and diverse set of considerations that have been there. The extent to which this is legitimate, the extent to which this is uh, proper, that's always debated. You know, uh, you and I might have different senses of what public interest demands. You and I might have different senses of what necessity demands. You and I might have different senses of what the uh, what it means to talk about the preservation of life or property, etc. So all of these things have been debated, but it, it's not it's not new. Uh, this has been done. It was even done when the Ottomans did their codification, the famous codification, Hartley of Hanafi law, the Majalla. Uh, they too chose opinions from other uh, traditions when they found that those were, uh, uh, you know, suited their needs. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jamal. Um, some of the questions we have already touched upon, but just to reiterate, re-emphasize on them. Um, so it may be dif difficult to define and deliver justice uh, in an ideal circumstances or ideal definition, but to what extent can our contemporary uh, notion of ethics can guide uh, the contribution or delivery of justice? Yes, I think, I think this is a very important question. Um, ethics, uh, certainly when we're dealing with uh, uh, areas which are new and where we are looking for guidance, you know, the ethical discourses have, always, have also been, you know, discourses of ethics and discourses of justice are, are close cousins. Right. Uh, sometimes what ethics is, is a more applied, can be a more applied form of discourses because they might pick on particular issues and they're not necessarily looking at them just in uh, what that might mean legally or what it might mean in terms of regulation. Um, but the considerations of what the right thing to do is are uh, as fundamental to coming up with ethical norms as they might be to come up with the, the canons of justice, which then might become justiciable. And justiciable, of course, is a legal term of art, which means something that you might argue in a court, right? Or something you might uh, uh, seek to be enforced formally. So I think ethics can, is, can be to some extent broader, but a very related uh, uh, discourse and very important for understanding what, uh, what the demands of justice are. I hope that's not too vague an answer, but yeah, that would be the answer. And um, Dr. Jamal, there is often, um, I don't want to say misconception, I want to wait for your response first, uh, but do you think that um, 
Sharia or Islamic law, whichever opinion we tend to follow, um, is it inherently in favor of the majority and does not take into account uh, the protection of minority or? You know, I, I, th I think quite the opposite uh, was the case. I mean, you know, there is the famous <clears throat> um, Pact of Medina or Constitution of Medina, which was entered into, of course, at the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And, and that, uh, uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, an agreement which tried to respect within the terms of, you know, political and social life of the time, the rights of a minority. So I don't think, uh, and, you know, of course, the Sharia also in its articulations was coming at a time when there were certainly other communities there, other Abrahamic communities, that were sometimes minority communities. And this is what I mean. I mean, you know, there, there have been times, again, it's not necessarily in the way we would see it today. We have, to, we have to adjust for the time. Can't be too anachronistic. But it's, uh, I think it, it took very much account of uh, the concerns of the minorities. Even this question of the dhimmis, uh, these uh, non-Muslims who might be living with under Muslim uh, majority rule, and uh, their status, you know, the idea that there was there was discussion about them and how they should be protected in uh, many respects. Again, not to the way that we would think of minority protection today, but in the context of the time, this is this has been part of the discourses for a long time. Okay, we are receiving a lot of requests. Uh, for your book in particular, and also if you can recommend a few books on this very topic um, for people to read. So, sure, sure. Well, I will um, let me let me uh, do that, and I can send them perhaps to you, Atash. Could you circulate them uh, if I if I did that? Yeah, sure. I sent you a link. Well, I, I think. Um, one of the top names would be Dr. Khalid Abu Al-Fadl's work and Khalid Abu Al-Fadl's work. work. Uh, Why Halak? There's another one that I, uh, let me see if I can just find it here, um, that might be, um, because there is a study on, uh, uh, it is a work by, the title of the book <clears throat> is called Religious Pluralism and Islamic Law. And it's subtitled Dhimmis and Others in the Empire of Law. The author is, his name is Anver, A-N-V-E-R-M-E-M-O-N. -E -O -O it was published by uh, Oxford University Press in 2012. So that is one that uh, I could recommend. With this, I would like to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jamal, for your time and for your knowledge. I think we all benefited a lot from your uh, knowledge, your discussion, and I, I think we'll be eager to get a hold of your book and also the book that you referred because it will help us. And I would also like to add that apart from the book that Dr. Jamal has written and uh, another one that he has co-edited, he has also written um, a few articles and at least a couple of them particularly talk about how uh, Ismailis historically have tried. It talks about the Ismaili constitution as well. So I would encourage our audience members to take a look at those articles as well. Uh, they'll be very helpful um, in appreciating the broader discourse with the particular reference of the Ismailis. So, with that, once again, um, thank you so much on behalf of Itra Pakistan. And um, we hope that in the future, you'll continue to be our guest, our speaker in the future sessions. Be my pleasure. Thank you all very much. Thank you.